Hi, everyone. We can't wait to talk to two educators today about teaching phonics and what's worked for them. As Lori said, we have not one but two amazing teachers here today with us. We have Julie Van Leer and Svetlana Svetkovich, and they are going to share effective and efficient ways to teach phonics. Welcome yeah. to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited you're here. Yeah, we met so long ago, and I'm so excited that you're both finally here on the podcast. So welcome. Thank you. Very so, exciting. Yes, long ago, but here we are. So long ago, I know. <laughs> So I'm hoping we can kick this off by share, each of you sharing a little bit about your story. So Julie, I'd love to hear from you first. And mm -hmm. also if you could share a little bit of context of what you've taught and what you're doing, anything about yourself you think it would be interesting for our listeners to know as we head into this phonics conversation. Alrighty. Um, I'm in my 23rd year of teaching right now. Um, originally I taught first grade for, for four years. So it was like eons ago, I feel like. Um, after my first four years, I moved to a different district, and I was teaching in the affluent country club school. Um, so it was a country club in our attendance area. So we had all those kids, um, principals from our district sent their kids to my school, administrators, teachers in the district. So it was sort of like the school to be at. I was there for 10 years teaching kindergarten, and then I was approached about moving to a different school in the same district. And at first I was like, nope, no way. And I, I moved. So this is my ninth year teaching um, same, same district, but in a high poverty school now. Um, in 2022, 75.9% of our kids qualified for free or reduced lunch. And I was in the same district, but I was moving and I, I stayed at the same grade level. Um, but I was flabbergasted my first, well, let's be honest, like three months of school because these kids who were coming into kindergarten, they couldn't recognize their name, they couldn't spell their name, they didn't know how to hold a pencil, they didn't know letter sounds, they didn't know letter names. Um, most of the stuff that kids at my old school knew how to, or knew what to do. Um, with that, you know, high poverty, a lot of single parents, parents working two jobs, one of the things that a lot of that has been happening since COVID is a lot of parents have the attitude school is not really important. So my old school, school was daycare. And so their kids had to go to school so they could go to work. Um, here, I have a lot of attendance issues, tardiness. Um, kindergarten, kids cannot be, cannot, you cannot file for truancy with them, um, but older siblings can. So I have two kids this year who truancy has been filed. Um, and so when I moved schools too, it was just, my kids couldn't do what they could do at my old school. Um, and then at the end of the year, we used iReady for our, our test and my scores were horrible. And so I'd approached our curriculum director about getting an intervention program. Um, he's older, he just retired, but he's very much in the mindset of teachers are the best creators of curriculum and knowledge. And so you know better than any program. And I said, quite clearly, I don't, because look at my iReady scores. And so through a series of really fortunate events, um, I stumbled upon Ebly, which is a speech-to-print curriculum. And Ebly is different because it starts with what children already have, which is language. And so I'm able to use Ebly with my Tier 1 kids, my Tier 2 kids, my Tier 3 kids. Um, I also, when my kids go to their specials, art and music, I go and help fourth grade and third grade um, kids who are struggling. And so that's my story. That's, that's amazing to hear. And I think you might have forgotten to share that at this point, three, and I don't want to speak for you. So tell me if I'm wrong, Julie. Okay. Three quarters of your class in November could spell CVC words. They could. They That's could. Your, yes. Your, your, I just want to say, your kindergarten, yes? Their kindergarten. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And just wait till you hear about what my kids can do that my partner's class cannot do. So it's good. It's good. We want all kids to be able to, to in, be in Julie's class. And Julie, we Yes, also, we do. You didn't brag, though, that you were, you were in, um, oh, which one the of Emily Hanford's? I was podcast. not in Emily's hand. Per, I was not in her podcast, but I was in, in the, the, movie, re, the truth right? about the reading documentary. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, why did I think it was the podcast? I'm the teacher who didn't movie tell star. her principal what I was doing. And then he noticed my really good scores. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I do know you were in the documentary. I also thought yes. you were in the podcast, no, but maybe I okay. just am making you more famous than I think. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll have to go back. Maybe I am. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Svetlana, we would love to hear a little bit about 
you, about your knowledge and, and what brought you here too. Yes, thank you again. Um, so I was a second grade teacher primarily for the larger scope of my classroom experience, probably about eight years. But in general, I taught kindergarten and first grade and some third grade. Um, and then, but what happened also like Julie, I was in a high poverty school, Title I, and many of my second graders kept coming in reading at a, at a kindergarten level and I couldn't get them to catch up. So I thought, okay, I'll go get my reading specialist credential. That'll fix it. Uh, so I went to school, got my master's, did the whole reading specialist thing, came with a few more little tools in my toolbox, but not enough to catch the kids up, you know? It sounds familiar, Lori. <laughs> we, did, we did the same thing. Lori and I did the same thing. Yes. I know, it's unfortunate. And it's yeah. unfortunate that the title makes you think that you knew. Well, for it, sure. Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. I go, oh, I should know, but, and I'm trying all these things, but it's, it's really the same thing. It, it was just covered up, you know, called something different or I don't know. Anyways, um, so then I became a reading specialist for the school, K-5. I did remediation there at that school for a few years. Um, military took us across the country to Maryland, and I became a reading specialist there at a middle school. And that's when I had a real big aha because it was on the other, co other side of the coast, and I had seventh, sixth, eighth graders coming in reading at a kindergarten level. And these are kids who have had extensive um, Wilson training, especially they did Wilson in that district, uh, Orton Gillingham as well, since kindergarten, since first grade. And they're in eighth grade, seventh grade, not able to read or spell. So that's when I decided I need to go get my, my doctoral. I'm going to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> do research. There's something missing that I need to find out what it is. And in my research, I really found um, this speech to print way uh, and really phonographics is what I what I stumbled upon first. And then that's when I started searching some more and I found Ebly and I got trained in both phonographics and Ebly. But then I decided to actually try the Ebly um, system with my first student when I submitted my dissertation, I go, oh, let me try this. Let me see how this is working. And I had a fourth grade dyslexic student who was struggling since, again, he was at about a kindergarten level. And I was able to remediate him in about, you know, six hours. He, he just took off. I mean, he wasn't skilled, he, but he understood for the first time how the whole thing worked. And then from there on, I've been remediating students ever since of all ages. I did my first adult uh, student a few, uh, about a year ago, 47 years old. And by our third session, he told me, you know what, Svetlana, I, I actually get it. I get it now. He understood how the whole thing worked after, again, years of remediation his whole life. So um, here I am today uh, sharing these stories and just knowing that Finally, it took all this time, right, to finally say, you know what, I could teach anyone to read and spell uh, at any age and any level to, to their highest potential. And I was never able to say that until I got trained in Ebly and the speech to, for, speech to print, you know, sort of principle that we follow. Yeah, this is great. And this is what we want to dig in even deeper right here. So um, Julie, you might have mm -hmm. some more successes to share with us, so feel free to jump in there. Svetlana, uh, you just shared some great ones with us. But I also uh, want you all to dig in a little bit with, you know, you mentioned phonographics, you men mentioned Ebly, but I know the teachers out there are thinking like, okay, so what are they doing though? Like what, <laughs> what's happening in their classrooms that's different than what, than what was happening before? Um, so mm -hmm. go ahead, Julie, and if you all want right. to share some more of your success stories yep. and then dig into what you're doing. All right, I can do that. Um, so Svetlana is the queen of data and like looking at data. So she made a little infographic that she was going to share. Um, looking at my iReady scores um, from 2020, 21 to 22, and then last year, 22 to 23. Um, and what you'll see on Svetlana's graphic is that I'm consistently getting my class um, to grade level by the end of the year as measured by iReady. So um, fall 2021, which is the year after COVID started, um, it's a year that everyone was complaining how kids, how low their kids were and blaming the COVID shutdown. Um, when we when I assessed iReady, when we did the iReady assessment in the fall, in September, I had 14% of my kids score above grade level. 
Um, and then springtime, I ready. So end of May, um, I had 81% above grade level, 19% at grade level, wow. and zero below grade level. Um, That's amazing. We typically have 26 to 28 kids in our class. So tier one, full group, um, I got that. And then last um, last year, um, started off a little lower. So when we did our fall testing, 4% of my kids were at grade level in the fall. Um, by the spring, 77% were above grade level, 23% were at grade level, and zero were below grade level. Um, first grade teachers love getting my kids because they're all ready to go. And this year, clearly, you know, not all the way through the school year, um, but my my growth is on trajectory just like the last couple of years. Um, so actually in the fall of this year, 0% were at grade level. Um, and winter testing, 32% were above grade level. And so um, it was truly only three months into the year because we did our testing September, end of September and December. So after three months, 32% of them were above where they needed to be. Um, So that was really exciting. Um, Another thing um, we talked about before was, or Lori, you mentioned this in the beginning, we talked about spelling. So I, I decided we really wanted to show how fast my kids have been able to accelerate their instruction. Um, And so I had done my spelling inventory in November and then um, end of February. So my teaching partner um, let me do the spelling assessment with her kids. And so it was, it was like, it gave me goosebumps and I was so excited because she's doing, um, she's doing a print to speech curriculum and she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. Um, But in um, February, I had only two, two students who were still in the pre-phonetic stage of spelling. And I had seven students that were already nearing um, the transitional, conventional phases of spelling. Um, and then my partner, she, um, she still had, so this was March, this was actually yesterday she let me test her kids she still had eight kids in the pre-phonetics the pre-phonetic um stage of spelling right now in march meaning that they're just writing random strings of letters they don't have a sound to symbol relationship going on Um, yeah but the interesting thing is so in march yesterday she had eight kids pre-phonetic with those letter strings but back when i did this the first time in november um I only had five students who were still pre-phonetic. So my kids in November were outscoring her kids now in the beginning of March. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that just, that really speaks to like the awesome things that kids can accomplish when you're Mm -hmm. like, you know, when you're using that speech to print curriculum. And much quicker, it sounds. Yeah, way quicker. quicker. And so... but just so I can add that, like, what really sh- shot up to me is that in the other class, just about nine kids are, like, at that CVC phonetic level where they're doing a match, whereas in Julie's class, 18 of her kids are at that level and beyond. They're actually going into the CVCE patterns. They're doing even the other, like, two-letter, you know, spellings like A-Y and the word day. Well, and blends. They're getting the blends. blends. Both and, both of the yeah. parts in the blends. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're getting through 25 words on the spelling test, whereas the other class could barely get through 10 words. Well, and something the- else I noticed, too, is that when I did it with my kids November and, you know, very end of February, like if I said the word jug, they would say j, write it, uh, write it, g, write it. Like they were fast. And when I did it with my partner's class, who's doing more of a traditional phonics, like they said the word, and then they got stuck, and then they started talking. Like, it took us forever because they hadn't been taught the code like my students had been taught the code. So can we dig in a little bit there? Like, mm-hmm. first of all, I, I really love, Pam Kastner said, when you're teaching spelling, you're teaching reading. And I feel like that's important to stamp um, because spelling binds, right? Binds orthography, phonology, and semantics. So it seems like your students are grabbing at that faster. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, like, can, can we kind of like dive in? And I, I think part of my understanding right now is that 
in the approach that you're using, students are not necessarily kind of bogged down by rules and they're learning kind of a lot of things at once. So mm -hmm. can you, can you share a little bit about what that looks like and, and maybe yeah. give us some examples? Yeah. So kids um, come to school with their language. And so we start off with those language skills they're already having. Um, and there's three principles that my students learn um, right away from the beginning of the year. So one of the speech to print principles is that one, two, three, or four letters can spell a sound. Um, then they, they learn that a sound can be spelled many ways. And then they learn that the same spelling can represent different sounds. Um, and so my kids, when I, throughout the entire day, not just phonics time, they stay on the same horse. So it doesn't matter if they're reading something in calendar, reading something in science, or writing something in re calendar, science, social studies, math. Um, all day long, they learn the principles of one, two, three, or four letters spell a sound. A sound can be spelled in many different ways. The same spelling can represent different sounds. Svelana, do you want to add anything on to? Well, I, I do. Um, <clears throat> so I'm really happy that Lori mentioned um, Pam's work and that spelling leads to that stronger orthography. There is a recent meta-analysis that I just um, read by, I don't know the name now. I'll link it to you guys, but ye, ye and somebody. But David Scher's work on self-teaching hypothesis, he mentioned their meta-analysis that just happens. That's when I dug around into their meta-analysis. But what they found is that the spelling led to a, an enhanced version of the self-teaching. So because Julie is actually starting with the spelling to teach the kids how to decode, um, they're actually gaining a stronger, like Lori said, orthography. They're connecting all those neural pathways a lot more efficiently as well, because spelling we know demands more from us. <laughs> you're a blank slate. You, you, you're you engaging everything to figure out what letter am I going to write for the R sound? What letter am I going to write for a? Uh, what am I going to write for G? And you're just trying to put some letters down on, on a board or paper. So these kids are from the get-go really integrating all those networks right away. And they're, again, understanding how the code works. And they realize that they're going to sound to spell and they're going to sound to decode. They're going to they're gonna use sound no matter what. And they don't view words differently. They just see a printed word and they're going to just apply sound. They don't know if it's a red word or a fancy word or any kind of other word that we're trying to categorize words under. They're, her kids just know that they're going to apply mm -hmm. sound. And if they don't know the sound, Julie's going to provide those sounds for them for whatever graphing they don't know the sound for yet. And so then if I could, yeah, I was going to say, if I could add on to that, you know, the kids, like Svetlana said, the kids know I'm going to provide the sound or the spelling if they mm -hmm. need it. So, you know, we don't have a high frequency word time where I do flashcards and lists or, you know, we don't put hearts around, you know, the, the tricky spellings. And no matter where we are in our day, or even like if we're in the hallway taking a bathroom break and there's all these signs by the bathroom my kids are noticing lately, like we do every we do our spelling and our reading the exact same way, no matter where we are or what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And for those words, I was going to ask you about these high frequency words that often are irregular words. We just had a lot, we had Katie Pace Miles and Danielle Kohlenbrander on to talk all about this, and it's really fascinating. But I'm wondering, like. Even if you haven't taught that sound or that sound spelling correspondence, you still tell them. Mm -hmm. Is that is that right, Julie? You still like yep. just you're like this is what it is. Yep. So um, lately, yeah. So lately, um, because my kids are doing so well, when I do a read aloud, I'm like, I'm not reading you the title. You're reading me the title. And so if there's a sound, if there's the a spelling pattern they haven't learned, you know, we get to it, they try it, and I'll just say, you know, say ah. You know, or whatever it is, and then they say it and they blend it together. And now it's sort of fun because we've done so much of the code. They're like, well, we did that before, or we know that, or they'll even say, no, we haven't, we haven't done that one yet. But it's just like, it's so, they're blank slates, you know, it's so natural to them. You don't and, feel like it's, I, I feel like the, 
the vibe is that that would be overwhelming for students, right? That you want to keep it to just like a finite number. You know, when I got trained um, in Ebley, which is speech to print, I was overwhelmed. And I'm like, kids can't do this. No way can kids do this. And I dragged my feet to start and I dragged my feet to start and all these excuses in my head, like they can't hold a pencil. They can't even write their name. Um, and I was shocked what kids could do. And then there was even times like I was doing my lessons. I'm like, well, they can't do X. So like I helped them and I sugarcoated it. And then I'm like, oh, I guess they could have done it. Um, and so I, like, I really had, I, my beliefs are what were, what told me was holding my kids back. I mean, my kids can do this and it's natural to them. They all can talk, you know? So they, it's, it, if I put my adult mindset then it is hard and they can't do it. But to the kids, there's nothing to it. Yeah. To add, Mm -hmm. I think Julie touched on something important in the fact that we're not holding them back. So meaning she's giving them as much of the code as she possibly can as quickly as she can. And they're not taking it to the point where they're overwhelmed, they're shutting down. These kids are excited for it. They can't wait for more of that code. They don't want to be in CVC land for their whole kindergarten year because they're not going to understand how the code works if they they just stay with those patterns. She's teaching the consonant E pattern already in October. By November, they're doing multi-syllable words, um, and she's teaching them how to tackle those both in reading and in spelling. And so the kids are empowered, and they have enough of the code by November to activate that statistical learning, which we all use to learn new things. And that self-teaching hypothesis takes over for them. And they're just, they're just moving on that train. So not all of them, of course, a lot of, so, you know, let's say a handful are always going to need extra doses, more time, more repetition. All those things are still um, the same, but, but the rest of the class, you know, is taking off. But those, even those, that 1% of the class or 2%, they're still making incredible gains that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, Svetlana mentioned, you know, all the things we're doing in the fall. And it's true because we, I start off with those princ- the, the, the principles for speech to print right away. So, you know, first they learn all the one letter spellings, you know, the ones that traditionally in kindergarten and in some first grades they take all year to work on. Um, but the beginning of October, the kids learn that sounds can be spelled with one, two, three, or four letters. Um, so then we're getting into digraphs. We're, you know, we're getting into the, you know, consonant E. Um, actually, mid-October is when they learn about the consonant E. And that plays into sounds can be spelled with one, two, three, or four letters. Yeah. And so they're spelling and they're reading and, you know, they're doing all these things to help them with that. Um, But then we also get into the same sound can be spelled with different spellings. And that's end of October. I mean, back when I did other phonics programs, we I don't even know if we were really into sounds by that point. And so that's why my kids um, were doing such outstanding things with spelling in November is because by end of October, they had learned the three major principles um, for speech to print. Is there a fourth one? We were debating. I don't. Okay. Uh, I said those are the three core. The those fourth are the three core. Okay. Multi-syllable word that you need to teach kids multi-syllable, uh, how they work in terms of how to take them by chunk. All syllables have a vowel sound. Those kinds of things. So that's kind of it plays into that fourth principle, but. I'd say it's just the three core okay. things of how mm-hmm. the code works. Yeah. But actually, you know, speaking of like syllables, my kids, I remember there was an activity we did with different spellings for O, one of the principles, you know, same spelling, different sound. And then they had to read, they spelled, and then they read some multi-syllable words. And so this was November and the kids could do it because mm-hmm. I believe they could and I set them up for success. So... I mean, multi-syllable words, you don't even do those until sometime in first grade normally. So I'm thinking about, I'm a listener right now, and I'm thinking, okay, there are these these tenets of speech to print that you mentioned, Julie, you called them out. I'm wondering if you've, you could kind of go through a scope and sequence. I, I know you, you alluded to it, you shared a little bit about it, but what does that look like? And I don't know. I'm picturing it being a little messier than like, okay, check the box. We've learned this, check the box. Mm -hmm. We've learned that because I, as a practitioner need to know all of the sound spelling patterns 
and obviously there's resources to help. Right. But I mean, I will tell you when I was an adult and I learned one of those, um, tenants of the speech to print approach, right. That, uh, sounds can be spelled with one, two, three, or four letters. I was, I didn't know that I was blown away and I felt really silly. I was like, hmm, Me too. how, how did I not know this my whole life? And then I just wanted to go walk around with it on a shirt for, yeah. you know, the whole, <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. How do people not know this, yeah. you know? Um, well, you know, it's it's so funny you mentioned that because when my kids go to gym art music, I go and work with some of the third and fourth graders and one year was first graders. And this little first grader, that up to earn way, the sounds can be spelled with one, two, three, or four letters is my absolute favorite lesson. Like not for kindergarten because they just sort of accept it and they're like, eh, it's just, you know. But when I work with struggling readers, that is like such a light bulb moment for me. So there was this one little first grader and I taught him that lesson. He hits himself on his forehead and he's like, you have got to be kidding me. He's like, why did nobody ever tell me this? And he said his name and he's like, I have a two letter spelling in my name. And so, and then even oh when I work gosh. with the third and fourth graders, like yeah. when you explain that to them, like Svetlana can explain it in better words than me, but like, <laughs> it's this light bulb thing. And it just like, it opens up this door to them and it all makes sense. Yeah. I think to them, they finally understand the logic that it is, or that there is not just chaos. Like how Lori, you were saying like, oh my God, it seems like it's chaotic the way you're explaining things, but there is a scope and sequence. We go from simpler to more complex. The difference is it's just going a lot faster and you're introducing more at the same time. So we're not going to just teach that the letter A spells the sound A. We're going to teach them right in that same lesson, A, Y is A, A consonant E is A, A, I is A. Um, and then they're just going to go, oh, and then they're going to see in this, like this, you, you create these categories because the way we learn is we look for similarities and we look patterns, for differences. Right? Yeah, exactly. Our brains are pattern seekers. So the way it's um, taught and, and Ebly has these lessons for free. Uh, there's an Ebly supercharged um, section on YouTube. And I believe it's maybe lesson I don't know, five or six, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll send you guys that link. But anybody who's interested in how this kind of goes, these sorts, these sound sorts, this is the key. And so then they unlock this logic of like, oh, okay, here's some, some spellings. This is more common than this one. This one likes to be at the end of the word. This one likes to be at the middle of the word. You look for these tendencies, but there's no rules. There's no hard set thing of this is always here, or always there but there's definitely more common, less common. And they just kind of take it and run with it. You know, they're not going to become masters mm -hmm. of that spelling <laughs> or that sound or different spellings right away. But again, it unlocks that statistical learning, which is what we want. We want that balance between explicit and implicit learning, what Seidenberg talks about all the time, and giving the kids more of that application to actually integrate this. We're going to not spend a ton of time on that sort. Maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes it takes to do that sort. The rest of the time, we're right away applying that to connect to text. We want to play the game. We don't want to just do drills all day long. We want to play the game and the game is actually reading and spelling, of course. So we're going to write a sentence afterwards as well of whatever we read, a quick little summary sentence. We're so into paragraphs always, now. Always <laughs> integrated. It's never just sitting in one little, you know, subskill. All the subskills are always integrated, which I think is a yeah. key uh, factor for anything to be efficient and effective. Is yeah, keeping for sure. Things well, integrated. And I think a key thing too is, you know, yeah, I do my small groups when my kids leave, but I'm doing this tier one with 26, 26, no, 26 kindergarteners. And so if, you know, if I'm not teaching to mastery. So, you know, every kid is at their level and the ones, you know, like they're all getting accelerated. So I'm not teaching to the middle. I'm not teaching to the end. I'm not losing anyone because there's so much interleaving going on. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's too, you know, that's why my scores and I ready are so good at the end of the year. And it's why so many are actually above grade level because they are just as engaged as those kids who are towards the bottom, you know, everyone's working, everyone's learning. 
I'm also wondering about, I've, I've had set for variability in my head for a little bit here. I wanted to ask you all about it because it sounds like you also set them up with this mindset from the very beginning, right? Instead of them coming in thinking, mm -hmm. okay, this letter says one sound, <laughs> this is the sound. And then, you know, months later, you're like, just kidding. It actually has more sound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not just in like one word, in like yeah. 2,000 words. The <laughs> word <laughs> yummy. The wor okay, today we did yummy. Yummy has the Y with a Y. And yum e it has a y e. at the end with an e, and the kids just they're like, that's how it, it goes. More than like one. right. So you're setting them that set for variability is that like where they get to play with it right in their heads. They mm -hmm. oh wait this this might say this sound, but you're you're bringing that to them from the very beginning. Day um, one of, of kindergarten, day. after we learn how to use the bathroom and we learn how to use the playground, we're right into our phonics. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy you said that, Melissa, because yes, I didn't mention that. So for variability is definitely a key component that the kids are introduced to right away. They're learning to be very flexible with all those spellings. And if they try once, they're going to try a sound, let's say it's the word above, they might start by saying a B O. Oh, wait a minute. That's not really a word. Okay, let's try try a uh, right here. And you're going to point to that grapheme with the A. Say a. Uh, and then they're going to go a. Uh, B. And then if they st try a try, uh, again, above. Okay, above. They got it. Oh, that's a word. Okay. So you're helping them. You're guiding them through that just enough. Again, not forever, but just for enough for them to pick up and take off on their on their own. But yeah. So and it's so ex Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just going to... Oh. You go. You go. I was Let's just going to say, it is we're, so we're gonna, exciting. Take a pause, though, because otherwise we're going to talk over each other. Ready? Pause and then be excited. Okay. It is so exciting to see as kids flex those sounds. Um, just yesterday, we were doing a sort with same spelling, different sound for Y. And I had 26 kids, but then three third graders joined me. Um, and that's a whole nother thing about how much growth they've actually made with doing kindergarten because it's speech to print. But just like I, so I had 29 eyes, pairs of eyes on the board, like trying to decode this word. And I'm like, I wish I could have videoed it because every single kid was engaged and they were saying a sound and then they flexed that sound and then they got the word and then the kid next to them got the word. And it's like, whoa, I bet there's first grade classrooms that can't do this yet. Okay, so I want to take us quickly back to a word we used earlier. I think you used it, Julie. Interleaving. I'm wondering if, uh, just Svetlana, you're next to me on the screen. Would you like to explain interleaving for us and how that works in what you're doing when you're instructing using this approach? Okay, great. So I love interleaving. Again, interleaving is just means that you're going to teach something one day. And then you're going to bring it back into the mix, let's say two or three days later, or even a week later or two weeks later, you never quite forget about it. You're going to weave it back in again. It's kind of like that spiral review sort of. So you're going to interleave and give those doses until you get more and more automaticity with whatever you're interleaving. And that's with any kind of skill that you're learning. But in terms of the scope and sequence of how the speech to print works, we're going to introduce, uh, let's say, consonant E, which is pretty tough at the beginning because you know, kids get a little bit frustrated with this advanced code. They're like, what? You know, what's going on? This this E hanging out the end? What? Is, oh, and they forget. But again, you're, that's a great opportunity to, to show them that flexibility. Oh, you're right. It could be A. Say A. And they just fix it. Um, but the point is, they're not. we're not going to move on to the next thing, meaning digraphs or the, the sort for the O sound, or the sort for the E sound, or the sort for the A sound, we're going to keep moving them through the advanced code, even though they're not getting, they're not always reading the, the CVC E pattern accurately with 100%. Because so to again, mastery is what you're saying. Like exactly. To a... We're not doing okay. mastery. We're moving them along through the scope. But interleaving consonant E always within any kind of a story because of course you're going to see you know the cvce pattern everywhere because it's very common so if you're using enough authentic text which we do they're going to see those things that you've taught them previously especially the easier stuff but we want to them to get to the advanced stuff quicker so we're not letting the mastery stop us from moving forward we're just going to keep interleaving well, and I think, you know, because of that interleaving too, my school is really transient. Um, I've gotten a bunch of new kids since November 
Um, I just got two new ones this week. And they, because we're interleaving and we're always going back and we've never taught to mastery and then moved on, these kids, they always come, they all, when I get them, they're always more like September kindergarteners. But it just takes, it doesn't take them long and they're caught right up too. Um, so, you know, it's the power of it doesn't matter when you get a kid. You don't need them from day one for them to be successful. I mean, they could they could start anytime during the school year. Because you're always interleaving and bringing it back around. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just want to pin exactly. that for everyone. <laughs> and integrating it in everything. So we're going to integrate it. They're going to write all the time. Like every opportunity, Julie, how many times a day do you think your kids are writing or spelling? Two to three, two to three. I mean, because if we have times something. a day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because if we have something in math that needs to be written, they're going to say their sounds and spell it. If we mm-hmm. are doing something with our science knowledge science. building, they're going to write it and spell it. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, somebody sends us a note, we're all going to read it. Yeah, and so Julie doesn't have spelling time, phonics time. It's it's all day time, and yeah. that time is always integrating um, not just phonics, but we're we're also teaching the kids how to apply phonemic awareness into phonics. I think this is key for how they're moving so quickly because we're starting with the word. So if we start with the word, uh, I don't know what's a good word to do. Um, let's just say cat for the simplicity <laughs> sake, right? Cat. Um, we're going to just start with that pronunciation. Cat was the first sound you hear in cat. And this child would say, K. what's the next sound you hear in cat? Ah, and we're going to do these little lines on the board, like sound lines, little placeholders as they're saying, identifying those sounds. Like an Alcona box. Uh-huh, like an Alcona box. At. Okay, we have these lines, and those are our little placeholders for those sounds. And guess what they just did? They segmented, right? They identified those sounds. I, don't, I didn't write any kind of a word yet. And now, if they don't know their letters at all, if they've never been introduced at all to anything, I would have little cards with some letters written down, little... Um, you know, flashcard things like or three by five. Sticky notes. Yeah. yeah, sticky notes. And I'll just have them, you know, a C, an A, a T, and maybe I'll have a P and an M. And I'll go, okay, which one of these is K? And they'll point to the K, whatever they think is K. If they get it right, great. They get it right. They could slide that, that K down. If they don't, I'll just say, oh, that's M. Mm, this is K. Okay, take it down. And then again, where is the A? Ah? Which one of these is A? Ah? Bring it down. Which one of these is T? Bring it down. Then... They're going to they're gonna erase that or get rid of that. And now they're, they're going to spell the word cat and they're going to say the sounds as they spell. K, A, T. So in that one little activity, they did phonemic awareness. They did phonics. They did um, letter, you know, associate pairing, right? They, they, they connected symbols to a sound. They blend. Uh, and if we wanted to, we could switch out a sound. Okay, let's turn cat into caught. What's changing? K. At, k, ah, oh, ah, that's not ah, that's ah. Let's get rid of the ah. Where's ah? And we could switch it out. Now that's manipulation of the phoneme. So you could do all that in just that same five minute activity. So and again, would you point out to that, Lana, if you were to do cat to caught, would you point out, okay, that the ah sound in k, at has one letter, and then let's see in caught. Are we, are we, are we explicitly pointing that out for students? I'm just curious. Uh, well, I just have an O I'll have an O. Uh, I'm I think, you know, I'm oh, hearing, I'm hearing, hearing you both. I'm hearing, I think it's, I, I think like, it's that's very advanced. I was here for it. <laughs> it's the different dialects. Cause I yeah. hear caught like the, the bed and I hear caught like I, I caught it. a I caught fish. Yep. I was yeah. doing it, caught a fish. But that's a good speech to print thing too. It is. Had it is. Well, it is. Well, I thought Svetlana was just really throwing one. out an yeah. intense example. And that's I, why we're I good spellers in November. I was tracking four with letters, I'm, one I'm, sound. <laughs> hey, that was October, so they're good for it. And you know what? If I had that four letter spelling on there, they'd they'd be like, oh, okay, they'd be fine. With they would just do it. I'm not gonna teach them that on day one, but. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't be a problem, but yeah, I know it's not funny. Um, I was actually recently working with a child oh. in, uh, in England. That was a really cool thing. Oh, that Julie is good. It's good. Hold on. Her light, her Just lights pause went out. and then start your story again. And then yeah. Julie, it's the lights in the, you know, when you sit still too long. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I worked with a student from London virtually, and it was my first a time working with somebody with an accent, we had different accents. I work with students from the East Coast too, but it's a little bit easier. 
but this one was totally different. So we did yeah. the sort on the same spelling can represent different sounds. In this example, it was the spelling A. A, I call a chameleon. He could be a lot of different sounds in a lot of different parts of the word. So, but it was interesting in, in London or England, the English accent, um, they only had, they had fewer categories than we did in our English dialect. So, or American, sorry, American dialect. So then um, I was learning a ton from him. That was really fun. So that was, that was uh, a good le learning experience, but, but with accents, we do have to take, take that into account. And, but again, which makes speech to print just so flexible and easy just to go, oh, you know, that's, to me, it sounds like, ah, to you sounds like, you know, however you say it. The awe and uh, to me, I, know, I can't even sound. do it. I can't even to do a Boston accent. Sound. I was trying. I know. <laughs> but you know, like even like take this word P O L I C E. On my resource room teacher who grew up the next town over from me, I was doing, we were doing that word last year, and she and I, you know, same town, same demographics, we pronounced that word differently. You know, and so that's not even like across the world right. or across the country. Right. That was like, you know, down the road. <laughs> But I love the flexibility still, like you said, right? oftentimes when that comes up, it's like someone's saying it wrong <laughs> instead of just honoring, like we say it differently and there are different ways to spell these sounds. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, the kids don't care. And I think because I reinforced those speech to print principles all day, like, I don't know if you, you guys remember, but I used to teach like sight words and then snap words mm -hmm. and then popcorn words and my kids could always say oh that's a popcorn word you know that's a, a snap word but they didn't know the word they just mm. knew it was one by sight so, they could identify yeah, they well they, they didn't even they couldn't even say what the word was they but they knew they just saw some they, some yeah, symbols yeah and so together, yeah. and was a popcorn word or a snap word, but they didn't know how to read the word and or of or whatever. But now, because I don't do any of those gimmicks, you know, they just, they see it, they read it. There's no big debate about what do you call it? You know, no big deal. We say so words. much instructional time. <laughs> Love that. Well, you all have been given some like really good tips for people in the classroom. I'm wondering if you have any more, I'm just thinking of those teachers who, you know, they might not, they a lot of teachers don't have the Ebley program, you know that, um, or a speech different program at all. But I'm wondering if there's any other tips you would give to teachers who might have a more traditional program, but just little things they might be able to incorporate um, in their day to get some of the success that you all have seen. Well, I know that one thing we do um, is that we say the sounds when we read and when we write all day. So, you know, if the kids know if they're reading and they know the word, they just automatically read it. If they don't know the word, they go right to the sounds. Same with spelling. You know, if you know how to spell the word, you just quick write it. If you don't know this, the spelling, you, you say each sound and then you attach a spelling to it. Um, so, you know, I think that is what gets me a lot of bang for the buck with my kids is that you're saying the sounds when you read and you're right. You know, it doesn't matter what we're reading, what we're writing. Um, they, they follow that same thing. I think that's a lot of the reason why this approach makes it just makes a lot of sense to me because that's how I work as an adult reader and writer versus I don't pause to as I'm like sounding it out to be like oh or, or reading it like does it have it, oh it has a bossy r or whatever like I'm just sounding it I'm out and it. then trying to make sense of it mm -hmm. and and using those like I guess quicker strategies I would say like I almost feel like sometimes um if I were to do it the other way, it might, I don't want to say bog me down, but it does, it does kind of interrupt your thought pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just like, that's, I just feel like this approach is just every time I read about it and, or I listen to teachers talk about it, it does, it, it just really speaks to me as something that I want to honor as something important in our space, you know, that we really need to, mm -hmm. to think more about. Yeah. Well, and there's no island teaching. So it's not like we do a, a specific phonics time and that's the only time we're reading and spelling. Or, you know, we have a writing time and it's the only time we're writing. If the opportunity presents itself to read or to spell, the kids are going to do it. I mean, even if it's, you know, the first week of school or the last week of school. 
And I would say phonemic awareness time and phonics time, which is yeah. There's no right now. yeah. There's <laughs> no like ten minute, five minute, two minute. It's all interwoven with you know when we're spelling and when we're reading. Because again, we have to remember what's the purpose of phonemic awareness. It's to get us to read. So <laughs> why keep it separated and isolated? There is a time and place for it for those uh, students who are who have that severe phonological deficit going for them or speech and language issues. Okay, you know, fine. But again, it shouldn't be a for everything. It should just be like literally three minutes, maybe maximum daily. But that's it. Everything should always be integrated to those printed letters because that's the whole point. And showing the kids that that's what, what the point of it is, because they're not going to just do phonemic awareness for phonemic awareness sake. What's the point of that? Or spelling for spelling sake. We're going to spell to actually write a story for someone to read or to share our thoughts and communicate what we think about the world. So again, keeping things very relevant and authentic, keeping it real for these kids um, makes a big difference. But to add to Julie, uh, the, the tip that I would give is watch those videos. There's free stuff. So you don't have to afford anything. There's a ton of free stuff. I could link a, a source that I compiled of a bunch of, there's just, there's Ebly free stuff. There's phonic books, um, free stuff on speech print. They have a ton of infographics that are for free to show them how to sort the same um, sound for different spellings. Okay. For the same sound there's, um, like I said, Ebly earlier has a whole like 20 lessons in progression. You wouldn't use those with a kindergartner though. Those are for second grade and older, but it allows you as the teacher to understand the process and how it all works. But the number one thing is say the sounds as they write always, whoever's doing the talking is doing the learning. So if you're saying the sounds for the child, you're doing the learning. But if you're having them say those sounds, the moment they're writing those letter graphemes, it's powerful. And I tell the kids all the time, I don't know, something happens in the brain. It's magic. <laughs> they love that word. They love that they're magic. So if they hear that, they're like, oh, okay, I'm going to say those sounds. I go, something happens and it just sticks and it stays in there forever. And you never have to do it again. But in fact, we those are, are magic always to sounding me. things. I know we are, we are always sounding like Lori said. Next time you write something, you'll hear your sub like you'll hear that voice. You'll hear yourself. You're going to hear yourself sounding as you write. You're going to hear yourself sounding as you're reading. You're not sounding out words because you're reading words by sight. But yes. if you're not, you're not going to always know every single word. If I pick up a study, a chemistry study that I've no no terminology of, I'm going to have to sound out a lot of words on that study. So you're going to hear my voice in my head sounding that out and taking it chunk by chunk. But I would, yeah, recommend investing in at least a small group of whiteboards. Whiteboard and marker is a huge, um, re, like a cognitive relief for kids. They just love those whiteboards. They're super engaged mm -hmm. with them. And it's making you, the teacher, get those kids writing and spelling, spell to decode, yeah. which again, creates that stronger um, connection and orthography. You want. Well, and I would think too, like getting out of decodable text. I mean, my kids yeah. are doing so well because, you know, I'm pushing them and if they don't know something, I just supply it, but they're not stuck reading CDC. I mean, the other, yesterday they read to me a uh, piggy, who is that? Elephant and piggy book, you know, and the yeah. sounds they didn't know I supplied. So, you know, like just getting into authentic text, you know, there's a really short window that you need decodable text, but it's not forever and ever all school year. It's a really good point. Yeah. So much more to say about that. If you have another couple hours to stay on, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a whole decodable text series. If you're listening and you uh, want to learn more about decodable text, we will also link that decodable text series. And Svetlana, I will take you up on that link. So we will mm -hmm. link all kinds of good stuff. Um, and also, if you're listening, sign up for our newsletter. We share a ton of free resources there as well. So we'll be sure to put a lot of these links in there for you too. Most importantly, though, thank you so much, both of you, for being here. We can't thank you enough. Um, I hope everyone grabs a whiteboard and starts chunking sounds and saying sounds and, and just so inspired by your amazing work. So thank you both. Thank you. You're so, welcome. So much. Thank you.